press a lot of local and global golf content. Alright, so first off, I just want to welcome you all to the first, the first of many, the plan, uh, workshops, uh, short golf performance and physical therapy here at the Golf Academy with Todd Campbell at Cranston. At the mouthful. Yeah, I'm Michael Edwards. This is Todd Campbell, uh, the 2022 Rhode Island PJ Teacher of the Year. Um, so I just want to thank you all so much for being here. Like, it really does mean a lot to me. Uh, for those of you who know a little bit about me, I'm a very relational, very personal person. Um, so it's just, it means a lot to me that y'all took the time to come here and spend with me and Todd. Um, and we're going to have a good time tonight. Uh, so the, the four things that we want y'all to take away from the night are awareness, right? So just making you aware of why you we, uh, move or swing the way you do. Understanding. So do you understand why you move or swing the way you do? Do you understand that there's not one specific way to swing a golf club, right? There's actually an infinite number of ways to swing a golf club, right? We all have different swings in here. But there's one efficient way to swing a club, and that's dependent upon what your body can physically do, right? Do you understand dynamic wall, uh, face angle, attack angle, center face contact? Well, he's your guy for that, and we'll be able to measure all that on TrackMan here in a little bit. So my last presentation was actually about five weeks ago, and it was actually under different circumstances. So I had the privilege to officiate the wedding of my brother and sister-in-law at the Swanson Association. So we had one person in attendance there, Connor. Um, so I vividly remember looking across the Providence River. Anybody who's been to the Swanson Association, this little strip of water right there that looks over, I believe that's Cranston on the other side. So funny story, I, I really, as I said, uh, I think it was Cam, my brother-in-law, I said, man, I wonder what it would take to clear that water with the driver. And <laughs> I, I don't think I have that shot in the bag, but and Todd, he probably would agree because he's seen my driver of late, and yeah. so is Connor. Um, yeah. But That's I might, work to do. Yeah. yeah. But I might have a chance, depending on the maybe. wind. Right yeah, a little tailwind, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so before we get started, I just want to give you all a little brief background of where we come from, just so you know where we're coming from when we are talking tonight. Um, I'm going to let Todd start off. Okay, thank you, uh, Mike. And I echo Mike's uh, thank yous to everyone for taking time out of your schedule to come on in. Um, we have a great facility here and love to show it off to everyone coming in. Uh, we want the wow factor as soon as you walk in the door and hopefully you got that. Uh, we've spent a lot of money on technology in here. We pride ourselves on having all this that usually is kind of reserved just for like tour players or really high-end facilities. This is a public facility. Anybody can come in here and take a lesson in the field, like a tour player, uh, getting that tour player experience. Working with track man, working with gears, um, seeing your swing from multiple angles, uh, standing on a force plate. We, we got everything in here to help diagnose what it is that you're doing. Um, I work with beginning golfers, and a lot of people are like, oh, beginner, I don't need all this technology. It's probably the best for a beginning golfer to get them to understand right away what it is that they're, they're doing and how we're going to help you fix your golf swing. A uh, little quick little background of myself. Uh, I'm a PGA professional, uh, Class A professional, uh, about 20 years in PGA. I've been a head golf professional at Ledgemont Country Club for 13 years. Uh, I started teaching full time over at Mulligan's Island about six years ago, and moved over here in November. So it's been pretty good so far. Yeah. Yeah. I tell Todd all the time that I have my first lesson with him. Actually, it's kind of amazing that well, I've never had access to any of this growing up my, in my entire life, right? Most people don't. So if you do have that access, it's like, if I could do one lesson with you when I first started playing the game, just get a foundation of knowing, you know, all this stuff that we're about to go into, like, I feel like just the, my game would improve so much. And I tell people, like, you just kind of keep kicking the can down the road, doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Well, this is, you can actually measure what you're doing, right? And so I, I just... I encourage everybody, especially the golfers, to take advantage of his services. A um, little background about me real quick. So I'm in my sixth year of practice of doctor physical therapy. Um, as you probably can tell by now, I don't have a Wicked Southern accent, um, but, but it's close. Um, so I just moved here from North Carolina with my wife, who is from Rhode Island. Um, so she brought me up here to be home with her family. And I, I will say I never thought I would move to 
Rhode Island, or she lost some various life in Rhode Island, and it's been the biggest blessing I could ever think of. So um, she's listening, so I love you. <laughs> um, but back in North Carolina, I worked for a sports city clinic for five and a half years. Basically treated everything from head to toe, from musculoskeletal to orthopedic, including post-operative rehab. Obviously, I'm passionate about working with the golfer. Uh, even more specifically, I love working with the spine, the shoulder, the hips, which are all pretty important parts that are needed in a golf swing. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to let Todd take it away. And we have Craig, who's going to be uh, the guinea pig. Guinea pig. <laughs> so let's have some fun, y'all. Hey, yeah, Craig, come on over and grab your driver. <clears throat> and basically what we're going to be looking at tonight, we're not going to have a lot of time to work on Craig's swing, but uh, anybody that comes in for their first lesson, we basically give you an analysis. Uh, we use TrackMan, we use video, get you to understand what is actually happening. Why is the golf ball doing what it's doing? Whether it's not flying straight or it's not going the distance that you want, okay, there's a logical explanation as to what it's doing. Now, my job is sit there and get you to understand what it is you're doing, and then kind of go through some tests uh, to see what your body is actually capable of doing, okay? And for some people, you know what? Their body is only capable of doing certain things, and it might be that swing that you don't like, okay? So everyone has their limitations, and my job is to help kind of work around those limitations as best I can and create the best uh, impact in the conditions and get you as close as possible to the ball flight you want. So I already had a quick conversation with Greg, uh, went through a little bit of history. Um, he's a slicer of the golf ball. Who slices the golf ball? Oh, jeez. That's my good to slice the golf ball. Um, so generally when we slice the golf ball, it means that the club face is open. You are going to lose distance if the club face is open. The opposite effect, if the club face is closed, you could in theory pick up distance, okay? Uh, we want to try and figure out just through a baseline series of tests real quick here We're gonna have Craig hit about maybe five balls with his driver and kind of see what his baseline numbers would be This is exactly what you start to experience when you come in here We, we do the same thing basically with everybody. We don't necessarily have people start with the driver right away usually warming up with a wedge So it's not like coming driving it on two wheels all of a sudden get the driver in your hand starting to fall Usually we go through a warm-up process. I interview a little bit trying to figure out what you passed experiences are, how much you play, how much you practice, what your injuries are, and then we kind of go into the whole process. Okay, but we'll just kind of fast forward it because we're on time crunch. Uh, you teed up high or low? Uh, high. How bad do you slice it? On mm -hmm. a scale of one to ten. Six or seven. Six or seven. Okay. All right. So you're going to stand right on this face. Now, just a uh, forewarning here that no rhyme or reason to it. Sometimes the tees will go flying backwards. Sometimes they go forward out into the range. Okay, so it's not like he's doing something right or wrong. It's just whatever the tee wants to do. So just a heads up if you see a tee go flying backwards. Everybody see those ball flights? Yes? Alright. Maybe one more. Would that be a typical one you got right there? Yeah. That's a typical one, huh? Yeah. Maybe one more. So we're going to look at that uh, second one that you hit. It's this one right here. And we're going to start to give you an explanation of what's going on. Okay. Uh, we're going to kind of look over here because this screen is a little bit lower. So when we're looking at track band, you got two screens set up here. One is actually showing the ball flight that uh, Craig just created. Then we have this one here that's starting to explain what is actually going on. Okay. 
So we have this white line here, the skinny white line, which is actually going out at our target, which is a white flag out in the distance. <clears throat> we have a little legend here that represents the club path and the face angle. So we can see his face angle in red is actually pointing right up the target line. Well, that's supposed to be a good thing, right? His face angle straight. But I gotta look at how did he make his club face straight? He had to swing 6.6 .6 degrees to the left to create a face angle that was straight to the target line. Okay? So there's already flags going up in my head about, all right, what, what do you got going on with your grip? Because something's going on with the grip that's not allowing you to square up the club face, and you have to go to plan B, which is I need to cut across the ball. So when you look at this, this is a this is what we call a glancing blow. I mean, it's not a direct blow. If I had the blue line, your path, and the base angle lined up, we'd be able to have the most efficient strike possible, and we'd get the most out of it. So he's swinging at 103.9 miles an hour, which isn't too shabby. Okay, what's a good drive for you? So at 103 miles an hour, you probably should be about maybe 275, 280. Okay, my job is to get you some distance. Okay, that's what we're gonna do. Okay. Right. How much time do we have? Let's see. Yeah, grip the club. Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna look at is Craig's grip, and I want to make sure that he's got a little bit of a stronger grip. A lot of people they have too weak of a grip, so I want to make sure that he can see a couple of knuckles on his glove hand, which we see. I'm also looking at his right hand to see if that's underneath the grip, and it is, okay. So the grip placement itself doesn't seem to be too much of an issue. What I would then start to look at is his grip pressure. How's your grip pressure? Probably on the stronger side. All right, so on the stronger side. So that might be more of the root cause of this whole issue. So your grip pressure in general wants to be on the lighter side so that your wrists are more flexible and they can actually rotate the club. Why would you think that you grip the club tight? Rip it and rip it, trying to get some distance. Uh, some people tell me, hey, I'm gonna have more control of the club. So a lot of people, when they grip it too tight, it takes too long for them to rotate the club back to straight, so they end up having to swing to the left. Okay. Now they made the club face straight, but what happened? They swung to the left, it's gonna create the cut spin back to the right. So what we want to do is we wanna get the grip to be a little bit looser so we're feeling this. We're feeling the right hand rotate over the left. Now when that right hand rotates over the left, we'll kinda of tell when the, the, the club face is gonna square up. If you do it too early, where's the ball gonna go? To the left. If you do it too late, where's the ball gonna go? To the right. If you do it at the right time, where's it gonna go? So people say, I wanna see if you do it at the right time. Golf is a hard game. It, it, it takes some some um, confidence in what you're doing, first of all, understanding. So you're gonna grip the club in your normal fashion, and you're just gonna go down to a grip pressure, probably about half of what you normally have, okay? So make your back swing. this right hand sort of rotate over the left, okay? If you can do that earlier in your downswing, you're gonna change the outcome of the shot, okay? You have a little bit more of this going on, that's still good, okay? So what part is coming through impact first, the heel or the toe? It's the heel, that's gonna be a weaker glancing blow. If you can get the toe to what, start to match up to the heel, that's gonna be more of a direct blow into the back of the ball. I'm just going to stop you just for one second here, and I'm just going to show you if I can find it.
like if he's swinging that much club head speed, he should be producing 270 to the 80 yard distance. So I just brought up one of my swings from earlier. I swung it at less speed than Craig. I swung it at 101 miles an hour. You can see the blue line and the red arrow are more matched up, aren't they? I found the middle of the club face as I did it, and my carry in total is a lot more than what Craig's is. And you swung faster than me, probably put more effort into it, and you didn't get as much distance, did you? So it's learning to control the club face first. If you can control the club face, there will be no need for you to what? Go to plan B and start what? Swing left to save it. Yeah. Right? And then from there, you just by, I hate to say by default, but it's easier to find in the middle of the club face, which is going to increase your ball speed, and then we've got to keep working from there. But it always starts in that, this process that we got to kind of look for the root cause of the issue. And a lot of people that I work with, it's either how they're holding the club placement-wise with the grip or it's tighter grip pressure and not being aware of the rotation of the club. Using a driver, it's hard. It's hard to dial in you know, that rotation if you're swinging at 103 miles an hour. And usually what I have to get students to do is kind of slow it down a little bit and learn to feel that awareness. Michael talked about awareness. You have to be aware of what that club is doing because if you're not, you're just going to go again to bad place. Yeah. Right? Go ahead. Softer grip. See if you can hook this one. Did you say that you never hooked the ball before? Uh, yeah, it's been a long time. Let's see if you can hook one here. So on a scale of 1 to 10, what's your grip pressure? Uh, going for light. Going for what? Light. Like, like what, on a scale of 1 to 10, what is it? Uh, like 3 or 4. 3. I like 3. Don't let the club out again. <laughs> okay. Where did the ball start? Did you see it? It started a little bit to the left. We can see on there, his face angle now was closed 6.3 degrees at the time of impact. Didn't hit it too well on the club face, and that's just part of the process. He'll learn how to square up the club face, and he'll start to trust the fact that he can close down the club, so he no longer needs to cut across the ball to save it. Okay. Let's try it again. So one of the next quick processes we're going to do is we're going to use some foot spray. Have you ever tried the foot spray? Yeah. You have? What have you seen? Don't have great... Uh... Has anybody else tried the foot spray? Oh, yeah. Yes? What do we see from foot spray? Well, clearly we're going to see an impact mark. Hopefully we're going to see an impact mark on the foot face. Okay, and that's going to tell us something about uh, a hidden kind of like uh, extra variable that's making that ball spin other than club face and path. Let's try it. <clears throat> hey, where's that in the club face? Okay, so if we're looking now, you found. <coughs> Would you say that this is the middle of the club face? It's middle, but not middle, okay? Toe versus heel, it's in the center, which is good, okay? But we want it to be, what, a little higher up on this club face here, okay? Do you feel as though you hit it low on the club a lot? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you normally tee it up this high? I do tee it a little higher. Tee it up a little higher, interesting. Okay, so let's see if I can go a little higher on the next one. Um, we want to hit the ball a little higher up on the club face because when we hit it low on the club face, it increases the spin rate of the ball. And it could actually magnify a ball going out to the right or a ball going to the left. So we want to hit the ball just above the middle of the club face, right about where my fingerprint is. Now, you're talking, do you like use like a railroad spike? What are you using here? Uh, I mean, I got some in my bag. Here? Oh, Bring it up, extra teeth. <laughs> Take your eye out. <laughs> well, that was different, wasn't it? All right. 
So we got him now because he used that taller tee. And you know, like, well, was there a? You know, most people will tell me that they want half the ball sitting on top of the crown of the club, and I think that's a pretty standard type of um, tee height that most people will kind of go for. But some people need a taller tee. Okay, what I care about is could he find the right height on here? And this would, would this be close to the middle of the club? Yeah. Okay, a little heel side, so he did want to add a little bit more cup spin, but you close down the club base, 9.4 degrees. How, what do you feel about that? Makes me happy. Makes you happy, yeah. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, your key went out to the rain, so unless somebody's got it in their back pocket over here, I don't know where it went. <laughs> it went out, yeah, it went cool. Went out? Yeah. So when it the, the, gets a little darker out, uh, track man has a hard time picking up some of this uh, data. Um, so it's just, uh, when we first were talking about doing this, but I didn't really kind of put two and two together that it was going to be this dark this early. So let's try it again. <coughs> heel hit on this one, okay? So heel hits, what do heel hits do? Anybody know what a heel hit does? It makes it spin to the right. Toe hits want to make it spin more to the left, okay? So him hitting a ball off the uh, the heel of the club, usually, you know, that, that when we start working then with like the, the foot mat um, or swing paddles mat, just to kind of see you know, how he's using the ground. Is he getting more weight onto his toes so he's getting close to the ball so it could be potentially something like this. What I want you to do on your next one is I want you to kind of stay more on your heels when you hit the shot. So if I can get you to be a little bit on the toe side, that's gonna add a little draw spin. Yeah. Okay, if you can square up that club face, what do you get? The shot going on the left hand side is no longer slicing, is it? No. <clears throat> and you'll be, in theory, starting to pick up more distance. Still isn't at the distance he wants yet because he's not finding the middle of the club base. <clears throat> okay. Is that the club? Got a little bit more on the toe. Did you feel staying on your heel a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah? All right. So, <clears throat> what would I be doing in, in his case now? I'd be sitting there trying to figure out, like, okay, I have to give him a reason. You can actually see him very here. I have to give him a reason to swing out to the right. Right now, he doesn't have much of a reason to swing out to the right because he's been fighting up a slice. So your your plan B is I'm going to swing to the left. If I can get him to learn to to feel a ball starting to the left, his instinct then is going to be to figure out a way to swing a little bit more to the right. But until his brain is totally convinced that he's going to be able to what, close down a club base, it's going to take a little while. Some people, you know, very few people just right away start to be able to swing more out to the right. But it starts with a process of like starting to be able to have uh, control over this club get the, the club face start to, starting to close down for the ball starting left. So now you're going to balance it. If you look at my swing here, just behind, okay? You see now my blue line is more out to the right because my face is closed because now my brain is telling me i got to swing more out to the right to well, offset the fact that the ball's looking, right? Now, a lot of people, they want to say, oh, I, I, I got to draw the ball. I'm telling you, there's just as much trouble on the left side of the golf course as the right side. Um, but when people are slicing the ball, they are losing distance. Um, they can gain some distance back by closing down that club. It does help deal off the club a little bit. You know, in some of the lessons we do, we talk about the dynamic loft of the club. What is the loft of the club at impact? When your face is open, you're actually adding loft and you're losing that potential distance. You combine that with a glancing blow, you just 
adding fuel to the fire of what? Trying to hit the ball as short as possible, right? So we're going to do one final one here. <coughs> Really going to try and get that face to be more closed than the path. So super loop strip, strip the cup. So I want you to feel more like this. Okay. And what I'm doing is I am twisting that golf shaft. I'm getting him to feel the rotation of the club. And if I feel any resistance in his hands, he's going to delay shutting down that club, and he's going right back to. The, the what the, the starting point again. So he's got to learn. Right, how do I get that toe to pass the heel? And you might say, boy, that's really hard to do. That that takes a lot of timing. Yes, golf is a hard game, and it takes a lot of timing. But you have to start first with an understanding of trying to get that toe to pass the heel. You learn to start to square it up. You learn to start to read your shots and say, hey, the ball's flying straight. I must have uh, a path and pace that are more matched up. And so you start to see that your distance starts to increase. Everything starts to increase in a good way. Ready? Top hands. Okay, so still a little bit left with that pass. So what I continue to work on him with is still learning to get that face closed more than the path. And then we will give you some path drills to kind of start to work into this whole thing. Normally, I'll have people in here for an hour for their first session, so we'll, we would have plenty of time to kind of go through, you know, working on some path drills and whatnot. But uh, this is usually the first start to it, getting them to understand why it's getting the ball fight that, that they're producing, getting them to understand how far they can potentially hit a golf ball without having to add any more speed. Are you shocked at how far you, you should be able to hit a ball? I mean, I don't know how far I should be able to hit a ball. He knows how far he should be on the ball. <laughs> that's but, that's right. more infuriating. Yeah, it, you're right. It's more. You know, golf is a very you know humbling game. It's a, it's a maddening game. But if you start to understand like more of the pieces and you use something like TrackMan, which at first a lot of people are intimidated by, it, but it's actually a very useful tool that helps start to see the process and helps you start to understand. Hey, I am starting to close down my club face. Hey, I can start to understand where I'm hitting on the uh, the club. I can start to see what my loft is. I can monitor my speed. I can start to see my distance gains. So that's kind of how we start to get your distance back. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to show you this real quick. Um, because of the darkness of the uh, the room, we do have a four camera system in here. So we got one going down the line. We have one face on. We have one from the backside, and we have one from overhead. So we're able to to utilize these videos to really help you from any angle, kind of see what is going on in this golf swing. Um, and last thing is, I will show you this. We use a whiteboard a lot in here, just a kind of diagram. <coughs> well, to my flag stick, there's a tee box. So a lot of people <coughs> will have a pattern that, you know, when they're slicing the ball, all their balls are falling short and out to the right. Once you start to learn to close down that club base, what happens to your distance? It goes up, doesn't it? Um, and in the end, you'll learn how to monitor how much you're actually rotating that club. And it's just a, it's a feel thing, it's trial and error, it's a timing thing. And if we can get a lot of these shots to be, you know, just right around the middle here, you're really optimizing the hitting straight shots and getting what we kind of encompassing here. Yeah, that was, it's crazy, it's like even just the ones in my first session with Todd, baseline numbers and saying, hey, what is my path? What is my pace? Get an understanding. How much are you actually giving up? There are some people that come in, their club head speed and their distance are spot on, meaning when they, they think that they should be hitting it further, but their club head speed, you know, unfortunately as we get older, club head speed goes down a little bit. You know, it's like, hey, we didn't, I don't hit it as far as I did 10 years ago. You know, it's just unfortunately, you know, the equipment kind of helps get a little distance back, but not as much as what we want. So, all right. Thanks, Awesome. All right.
All right, so this is more like the movement-based portion. Um, uh, has anybody ever heard of Chuck Peterson? Anybody know Chuck Peterson? Any happy, any happy yeah. Yeah. fans? Yeah. Yeah. So what does what's Chuck say? It's all in the hips. It's all in the hips, baby, right? It's all in the hips. Um, now, so really, the hips do play a very important role in the golf swing, right? So in the golf swing, the hips, in particular the pelvis, is considered the powerhouse of the golf swing, right? So I got a couple uh, patient working on his exercises right now. That's good. Yeah. I like it. So, I mean, literally, so if, if you can understand what position the pelvis needs to be in in the golf swing, and you sound it up with the stuff, the technical stuff that Todd's taking you through, like you're automatically going to uh, gain distance, like it was guaranteed. And that's the mind blowing thing. That's, that's the, the, that's the awareness of understanding why you move the way you do. Um, so interesting, interesting, interestingly, I had the, the privilege, I was actually the physical therapist for the players at um, Rex Hospital Open, which is a foreign credit tour event in North Carolina. Um, I think the closest one here is probably the live and work in Maine Open. I think it's like June or July. And what I found pretty fascinating with working with those players is how crazy and ridiculously in tune they are with their tracking numbers. Like it's insane. And so, but on the flip side, what was pretty amazing is how not in tune with their body they were. So they are way more subjective when it came to understanding why they move the way they do or what they feel. And so, you know, that's what my role came in is kind of objectify, okay, well you're limited in internal rotation of your lead hip. So if you're right-handed golfer, left hip internal rotation or else okay some compensation is going to occur whether you want to hang back slide whatever it may be but just having that conversation that it, that conversation with those players was very like I, one i was like a nerd like i was in my, my i was in my element talking golf with these players but it just made me realize like what we're teaching you is applicable not only pj tour uh, four grade tour which is the development of the, the pj tour is applicable to everybody Right, so the same stuff that I'm about to take you through exercise-wise, the same exact stuff, a good majority of it, that I gave to those players, and was able to see differences in just what they do in just like a 30-minute session. Um, so, without further ado, let's have some fun. Can anybody tell me, obviously the pelvis, but what are some major players in the golf swing as far as like a structural component, as far as body region? What do you think has to? What's, what do you think is important to be able to have a an efficient golf swing? Your core. Core. Right. Legs. Glutes. It's glutes. That's right. So the glutes are the king of the golf swing. It's one of the famous sayings. So shoulders. Shoulders. Yes. So I'm gonna kind of like just super umbrella. Like think about the golf swing is a very rotational sport, right? So the golf swing is a high complex rotational movement, right? It's a terrible movement for your body, but if your body is in a position and it's in shape to tolerate that much force, then okay, it's a different story. Um, but think about shoulder mobility, spine mobility, hip mobility, right? Those are your three main areas that you need to make sure you have to check if you're going to be playing a lot of golf, especially as you start to age and potentially lose some mobility. Um, again, your body is a master compensator, so it's going to find some way to get to the top of your swing, no matter how that looks, right? So it's going to find some way to get there. And so usually when, it's, when it finds that some way, it's when you're telling yourself a free injury. All right, so what we'll do is we're going to take you through three tests, and we're going to follow it up with an exercise to address the physical limitation in that test. And then after we go through the exercise, we'll go back and we'll reassess that test, and you should have improvement in the area that we're going to work on. So shoulders, spine, hip, is what we're going to address tonight. So thankfully, Craig's continuing to be our guinea pig. Thank you, brother. So the first thing is hip. All right, so I mentioned so think about it. your hip and your shoulders are two ball and socket joints, right? So there's a lot of degrees of freedom. So in particular, for a right-handed golfer, when you go into your backswing, you need right hip internal rotation, okay? So my femur is literally going internally in relation to my pelvis. All right, everybody see that? So impact and follow through, but vice versa. So now my left thigh femur has to be able to rotate internally in relation to my pelvis as it goes over and I follow through. So this exercise here, this test is going to assess your internal rotation of your hip. Okay, so we have we call this a closed chain position, so my feet are grounded. This would be an open chain. So that would be internal rotation, right? So my whole leg, my femur is moving internally. That would be external rotation. 
when you go close to him, if you'd have grounded, and I go, well, this is my right side, and now that, that's, that's the interpretation of my, my right hip. So, Craig, I want you to go onto your back. So what we'll do is we'll demonstrate here, and then I'll have everybody kind of break out. There's more space on the other side, but we might be able to get away with right here as well as in the um, kind of foyer area. So, Craig, let's go all the way down. I want you to bring your knees up into like a 990 position. Take your fist, arm straight, in between your knees. You're going to squeeze your knees into your fist. And then all I want you to do here is rotate your shank out as far as you can. And so what, I'm, what I want Craig to do is see how much of his shank to the outside of the calf can he see. All right, so it's a little subjective right now. But I could also get like a, they call it a goniometer, but I could measure physically what the angle is. So normally, I like to see at least 30, 40 degrees of internal rotation. Okay, so he's probably like 15, 20 there. All right, do the same thing on the left. Okay, anybody see a difference there? Mm -hmm. Go again to the left, left, mm -hmm. left, and then go to right. Keep this tight, keep this tight. So I'm already I'm seeing less here. Can okay, people see that? Mm -hmm. All right, go left again. All right, so let's the uh, right side, let's do the limited side. So now let's sit up. Let's go into a 90-90 position. And for those of you that might not be able to get into position, I'll show you a modification, okay? So I want this front leg to be 90 degrees, and that back leg to be 90 degrees. So you can it there. Is it okay there? All right, so from here, I'm going to have Craig, you're going to basically, I want you to hinge. So not to hinge, I don't want you like flexing around the spine. I want you to literally just kind of lean forward and see if you can bring your hands out in front of you. And you should feel a pretty good stretch in the back of that right hip. So looking for a stretch here. You feel that? All right, so now when you get to that point where you feel you feel a nice yeah. moderate stretch, you can hang out there and take a deep breath in. And on the exhale, we'll try to sink into it a little bit more. So really a good goal would be to try to work, think about like a 10 to 12 o'clock range, right? So you can kind of just work this range. And you feel more if you go towards like 10 o'clock. Take a deep breath in, deep breath in. Expand up the cage. Exhale, reach more, reach more, reach more, reach more, reach more. Light, moderate, heavy. Heavy. Heavy, okay. All right, come out of that. Let's go back to that position. To the back. Yep, that test. So now, even the back leg here, like, you're definitely going to feel a stretch here as well, right? So just be careful. Listen to your body. Don't push them any pain. Right, typically, if you go forward, like, if you lean forward, if you have pain in front of the joint, that tells you, it tells me it's more of a joint issue. Whereas you shouldn't feel the stretch in the back, because that's more of a soft tissue, just tightness. Joint capsule, don't push the knee All right, so same thing here, lift up. So we want you to squeeze into your hands and rotate out. Right, so maybe like five degrees, go again, go again, go again, rotate out, out. Okay, stand up. I'll show you one more modification. So I want you to get into your, get into your golf stance. Do the lower quarter rotation, kind of call it for so, good golf stance, good hands on the hips. I just want you to load into your right hip. So don't extend that leg, keep a slight bend in that right knee. And it's almost like he's trying to sit his right hip back towards a 530 o'clock. So just looking for you to feel a little stretch in the back of that right hip. So what we're doing here is we're stretching, it's called the posterior joint capsule. Think of, if you have a ball socket joint, around that joint is a joint capsule that provides stability so the, the socket or the hip doesn't dislocate the socket. But that joint capsule will still, especially the back side, will limit your internal rotation mobility. Give me one more of those and let's go back to the back and do this. Alright, let's go back to your back. And then the same thing. So bring these up, push in, and then do it again. So you can see just by one little exercise, you might gain five, ten degrees, right? So now, granted, if I did the same thing to him maybe an hour from now or tomorrow, he'd probably default right back to where he was at the beginning. So it just it's going to show you the body can change, right? So we're just going to continue to make that part of his exercise program um, and then follow it up with, okay, we got the range, but let's, what can we do to maintain that range? That's when you start strengthening within a new range, right? So we can work on mobility all day. It's just once you have the mobility, what are you doing to then strengthen or stabilize within that, 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 that new range, right? Does that make sense? All right, so 
let's practice that real quick, and then we got two more movements we'll go through after that. So y'all can spread out wherever you want. The only thing I would say is don't slide on this, correct side? What that? Don't lay on this. Oh, they can. Yeah, they can. Okay. Okay. So just get a feel for it. So just go. I'll, I'll walk around I'll, and I'll uh, get some cues. Yeah, i here. Okay. So just go on the back. Yep, so you'll go nice and here. Yeah, all around. Right. So you're going to push your knees into your chest. Yeah. Yeah. Push your chest in your chest. 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 Yep. Yeah. 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 The hard part for you to get it right. Uh, you can come here if you want. Okay. The hard part for you is going to be getting your spine upright. Oh, yeah. So you probably already know what you're saying. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, what if you lean forward? Do you put anything in the back of your right hand? Mm -hmm. Just right here. Mm -hmm. so, I was going to stand up. It should have stretched up for heaving you. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's why you can't. Two more 
I might just go with the I might just go to the get uh, go with those few together, and then we can do this at the end for at home for time purposes. So the hopefully I'll notice a little bit of difference, right? If you if, if you can't really get a good stretch in the back of the hip, that hip, maybe get a little bit more in the front. That tells me that this could be some good maybe some good uh, hip mobility work. It's more like for me, that's why I keep there deep and do some joint mobilizations to free that joint capsule up then allow you to access the soft tissue and get the stretch there, right? Um, all right, so next, uh, spine rotation. So I'm gonna have Craig actually put on this idea. So we get into like a child's pose position. And now I'm having you bring both forearms midline. So the elbow is kind of right under the chest. I want you to take your right arm, go behind your back. And I want to see you rotate your torso to the right as far as you can. All right, so when you all do this, the goal is almost pretend like you're rotating inside of a barrel, right? So I don't want the current section side bending or dipping a little too left. So that's why I just give them a little cue. And then also, when you rotate, just look and see how much of the surroundings behind you that you can actually see, right? So that's kind of like, that's your, uh, kind of like your objective because that's how much you can see. We're gonna go do an exercise, we'll come back and reassess and he should be see should be able to see a lot more behind him. Alright? Now compare it to your left side. So right forearm down, left hand behind, and then rotate. And so really all this is doing is so in the child's pose position, we call it locking out your low back. So think about your spine is three sec uh, three basically segments. You got cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine. Your thoracic spine is your main rotational area in the spine, right? So you get cervical rotation, yes. Lumbar spine is more of a, a function extension that does not like rotation. Your T-spine is where you capitalize on your mobility and exhaustion, right? And in life. I mean, just simple stuff like, you know, turn with the tractor, right? So the problem comes if you don't consistently access those end ranges is when you become stiff and tight, right? So that's why when you try to go to the end range, like, nope, I haven't been there in a while, the body looks good, right? So let's do this. Let's sit up. <coughs> straight on. So let's go right foot, cross your right foot over your left foot. And I want you to take your hands behind your head. And then all you're going to do is just give me pure rotation. Rotate to the right as far as you can. Kind of the side then. Good. And I want you to give me three deep breaths. And so when I take the same deep breath, I want you to think about rib cage expanding. Alright? Keep going. So breath plays a huge role in your mobility, right? So three things I like to tell people that impact your ability to rotate. So right, spine's a huge rotator. So think about your thoracic, we call it the thoracic lumbar fascia. Basically all the soft tissue that comes off of your spine, okay? Your rib cage, and then also your actual joint mobility. So all three of those play a huge role, and if they're tight, or if it's limited in any one of those, it's gonna restrict your range of motion. So you might in yoga or in workouts, or you just might think, you might hear people say, take a deep breath in, exhale, right? That's because they're trying to help help increase your range of motion. So there's the, the science behind that. So come back up. Sorry, I got distracted. All right, we're take back to the right. Give me three deep breaths. Think about like the bucket handle. You really expand that rib cage. One more. All right, stay there. Now I want you to take your right elbow, put the hand behind the head, do a side bend to the right. So you need one more. And then stay right there, keep a deep breath in. Good, now I want you to side bend to the left. Deep breath in. And come back, and then rotate and do some more rotation. All right, so now let's go back to that. The left forearm down, tip that back, and then rotate to the right. How's that? Is it a little difference? Yeah. Yeah. So just by doing that one exercise, you're already giving them 10 to 15 minutes of range of motion. Again, it goes back to we're giving them ability, right? Now, what are you going to do with it? That goes for myself, that goes for anybody who does any mobility work, right? But I love mobility. Probably not as much as stability or strengthening as I should in the new range. Um, but hey, everybody's got something to work on. It goes for life as well. 
Um, and then, so, I'm, for time's sake, we'll go on to the next one, but I'm going to send y'all all these exercises tomorrow. So before you leave, there's actually a, um, a clipboard. Just put the name in your email for me, and then I'll send you all this, uh, these, these videos tomorrow. Um, all right, last thing. I'm going to be the prop this one because I know my short ability is worse than yours, actually. So, so we've gone through the hip, we've gone through the spine. Lastly is the shoulder. So, think about, actually, everybody stand up for this one. This is pretty easy. So, normally, just in your standing posture, if you bring your arm out to what we call a 90 90 position, so we call it 90 degrees abduction, 90 degrees elbow flexion, and then I want you just to rotate your forearm back. And just see where your forearm is in relation to your spine angle. All right, so you're a little short spine angle, maybe a little bit. Very good. So normal is everybody can see like your so your forearm should be parallel with your spine angle. All right, so now I want you to go into your golf posture. Bring that arm right back up to that same position. Now I want you to try to do the same exact thing. And just see what you notice. For some of you, you may be okay. Like you, your your forearm should again, it should be parallel with your spine angle, right? And then so the, the the common rebuttal is, well, I bent forward, obviously I'm have less range of motion. Well, yes and no, right? When you go forward, yes, gravity's pushing down on you, therefore it makes your scapula, your shoulder blade, tilt forward, which the scapula is where the socket is for the ball and socket joint. Right, so if the scapula is theoretically if it's sitting more forward, well, then it's going to have less range of motion for the ball to move in the socket. Well, you should still be able to sit that shoulder back through your mobility in your spine to allow for that full external rotation to still occur. So if y'all can see it from me, is I'm actually just, I'm shy, so I'm actually short of my side angle, right? So there's two things I want to show y'all that you can do to help improve that. So one is to stretch the lat, right? So the lat comes from one biggest muscle in the body. It comes from all the way from the low back, all the way through back, and it attaches to your shoulder blade and to the inside of your arm, okay? The other one is your pec. So your pec minor in particular is a muscle to the front. So everybody does this, right? So I'm, all, I'm a big fan of posture, right? Posture changes everything, literally. So if you can loosen up that pec, it can get that scapula to sit more natural and which means the scapula sits back, it frees up the socket to allow more range of motion for the ball to move when you do anything overhead, right? That goes for anything in life as well. So just reaching overhead, putting stuff in your cabinet. So let's do this. I got a few props. I want you for <laughs> I saw your shoulder. So here, show me. Let me give that to you. All right, so let's come here. I'm going to do it with you. So the first thing is I want you to use your golf stance, like an athletic stance. Okay. You're going to take the PVC pipe mm -hmm. on the outside of your right, uh, let's do your left side, left side of your right shoulder. Yeah. So take your hands on top, both hands. Just kind of look more. That's good. So I want you to stay into that golf stance. Mm -hmm. You can actually kind of look over on the, on the shaft. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so what you want to do here is I want you to just push that away. So it's like you're going to be just yep. kind of reaching, mm -hmm. you should feel a good stretch yep. with your lat. All right, so same thing here. I want you to take a deep breath in, so hold this. Deep, deep inhale, expand that ribcage, maybe. Exhale and push it away. Good. Need one more. I'm doing iron blacks. Okay. So I'm going to join you. And so as I exhale, I'm really just trying to sink down into a little more as I get a little more rotation to really just intensify that stretch through here. So just for me, by doing that, can everybody see a little difference there? Yeah. So I'm already probably closer to my spine angle, right? The other thing, I think this is actually has a little more bait for the buck, is everybody see like a real way pec stretch. So, um, Yes, yeah, so Mike's doing it. I'm gonna show you. Actually, you can do kind of like a partner stretch. Actually, let's see. Here, give me your left hand. Come up here, and I want you to drag. Yep. So I just want you to kind of hold right there. So keep your forearm tucked in my forearm. Yeah. Go take your right foot forward, left foot back. 
Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah. If you have any questions about the technology I use in here, if you want to pick my brain a little bit, feel free. Thank you to you folks for tuning in live. So also the other thing too is you put them on the workshop available. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Hopefully, uh, like, I'm pretty close. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thanks a lot. Hey, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I won't tell you what I used to do. I know the working people, which I have been working on stress here. 
it should be over. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. definitely yeah. should be in the grand yard. Yeah. Assuming you're hitting up on the ball to the yeah. the base or man is yeah. you're hitting the ball in the middle of the club base. There's a lot of things that have to see to happen. But the starting first with the club base. The club base, you hit your club base, then all of a sudden you got to start to yeah. what makes up the base. At that point, yeah, it's good you got the speed, but you're not getting the right kind of this output out. This is it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, try to and whether it's trying, you're trying to get that extra. Okay. Uh, if I slow it down, I can't. Yeah. Yeah.